This episode of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on October the 19th, 2015. Enjoy! Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Okay, everyone, it's uh, one o'clock, time to start. Um, now, I had one question before the meeting started um, about essentially what the OEM, the original equipment number, is for your computer now that they are upgrading to Windows 10. Now, when you, um, when you install uh, Windows, anything from XP up, it, really right back to Windows 95. When you install, um, you are required to enter Microsoft's 25-digit original equipment number, whether you got it off of the back of the computer where it resides, or you got it off of the disk which you bought to upgrade. Um, that original equipment number is, requ is required by the computer to make it work, talk to Microsoft, uh, make sure it's genuine so you get your updates and your upgrades and all of that stuff. Um, that held true uh, up to Windows 8 and 8.1. Um, when you upgraded to Windows 8 and 8.1, um, Microsoft came up with a new scheme to make sure that your computer was genuine with this new operating system. Um, because Windows 7 could so easily be defeated and made genuine as well as Windows XP, so it was trivial how to do it um, to make any copy of Windows XP, Vista, and Windows 7 genuine. It, it's a trivial thing to do. So in Windows 8 they came up with a new scheme whereby um, when your computer um, was first launched with its new operating system uh, you either entered that 25 digit code or it was supplied by the machine inside the machine inside its guts. There's a number in there. And um, that, that number is, every time you start the computer up with a connection to the internet, that number is broadcast to Microsoft and it checks against this database to say, is that a valid number? Okay, if it's valid, continue on. If not, you will get a message saying that this may be pirated software. Okay, um, it's going to nag you to buy it. In Windows 8 and Windows 10, if you upgrade from Windows 7, it, um, the computer is assigned a brand new OEM number which is buried deep inside the computer so it can co contact Microsoft and check against the number. If you have, ever have to reinstall and you don't have that number, all is not lost. Microsoft performs a really neat trick with your computer and that original equipment number. What it does is it takes, a, takes into account everything about your computer. It's uh, how the software is set up, what the version of the software is, what versions of hardware you have, what versions of drivers you have to make the hardware operate, and on and on and on it goes. And a number is produced inside the computer that is really it's special to that computer because just about every computer after three weeks is completely different than what you started with. So Microsoft is now able to 
reliably make that number inside of the computer or, a, or something close to it. And if you reinstall Windows 10 on your computer after the upgrade, this number is reproduced by the computer in Windows 10 and sends that to Microsoft. And it asks, it tells uh, Microsoft, or the computer tells Microsoft, here's the number I have divined that is a hash of all of the things that are inside this computer to make it unique. Check against that number. And lo and behold, there's your computer. Already there with an OEM number, which will probably be downloaded and installed into your computer, into the hardware. And you then have um, the computer back the way it was before it crashed out and you put a new hard drive in it. Um, and the computer is now um, capable of running Microsoft Windows 10 and it won't nag you that it is perhaps a pirated copy. It's, it's a good copy. I think that's fantastic. I really do. It takes a lot of the burden off of my shoulders uh, as a technician to try and divine what that number should be. It's already done when you load Windows 10 and that number for this computer particularly will just, if I ever have to reload Windows 10, that number will be divined by the, by the, uh, the operating system, sent to Microsoft, and they'll say, oh yeah, we have that on file, you're good. Okay? So, the original equipment number. It's not really necessary anymore unless you're doing uh, a reinstall of Windows 7. Um, then I'd like to have it. I'd like to be able to have it as uh, um, an easy way to put Windows 7 back on a computer. There is an easy way and there is a very difficult way to do it. I like the easy way. Okay, so that's all about um, the original equipment number, the OEM for, uh, from Microsoft in its um, operating system and how it works. Um, and you should not have any more uh, issues from here on in with Windows 10 about, well, if I lose the number, how do I reinstall? Or if I didn't get a number, how do I reinstall? The computer has already done that for you. And a reinstallation <coughs> with a clean disk is the way to go. So you're saying it's not on the... It's, it, yes, it's... It, no, uh, the, the, that number I'm talking about, this original equipment number that Microsoft prov provides to you, is generated by Microsoft, downloaded by your computer when it connects to the internet, and is installed on the computer hardware. Okay? Not it's, no, into the computer hardware. It essentially is go, it goes into a BIOS chip. The BIOS chip is written over with this number in new modern computers. On old computers, yes, it's resident on the hard drive because the BIOS chip is not capable of making this flashover of this new number. But uh, as I said, uh, that number can be redefined by the operating system when it's reinstalled. Okay, so that takes care of that. Um, we'll come back to that later if you have any questions about it, think about it. What we're going to talk to about today is email the basics. We're back to basics again. We've been on basics for two months. Let's stay there because it seems to draw a crowd. <laughs> um, and we'll start off the basics of email with an email package that um, you're going to have um, probably on your computer. Uh, this is, is Windows Live Mail um, that I put on here, but it is a local um, program for email. And when I say local, what I'm really talking about is a program that is installed on this computer 
It's a program that's installed on this computer that manipulates your email, that downloads it and sends it out when you hit the send button. So it's a program that's manipulating your email and it's local to this computer. If you get email, it's saved here. It's local. Is that a better idea than Gmail? Or we'll come to that. Um, better idea? Mm, hard to say. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go. Um, this is my email account. This is my Gmail account that you're seeing right here. And so the, the, uh, the local program for email is manipulating my Gmail account, which is on the cloud. Okay, but that's a special situation. And we'll, we'll come to that. What I want to talk about really is what the local program does for you. It does for you and there are things that it doesn't do for you. What it does do for you is save all of your email to the local computer. This computer right here. It's all saved. Every email that comes in is a bundle of data and it's put here. If you... Um, and the program allows for the manipulation of that little bundle of data to save it here, to send it to someone else, to add to it, to modify it. All of the things that you can do to any kind of file you can do to an email. Okay, you can modify it, you can give it to somebody else, um, you can save it and change how it works, all kinds of things. Whatever you can do to a file, you can do to a local email message. In this, as I said, in this case, um, I'm using a local client to manipulate Gmail, which is a cloud-based email system, as Hotmail is. Okay, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, a lot of the, uh, anyone you, that you can name that you get as a service from a, uh, from, G, uh, from Google, um, Microsoft, Yahoo, Apple, okay, they have cloud-based email systems. Um, your iCloud email account is cloud-based. But they can also be manipulated by this local program. One of the basic things, tasks that you can do with an email local program, or any email program for that matter, is it downloads your mail, as people have sent you mail, it downloads it to here, and you can read it at your leisure. Soapy Mondays brings you the latest news and gossip from Corinne and Emmerdale, whoever they are. So I have the latest Soapy Monday gossip news. Oh, that's from Scottish TV. Wonderful. Um, and it's giving me, I don't want to know about that, thank you. Um, it's giving me the email locally here as it downloaded it. I can, I can forward this to whoever I would like to if I hit the envelope here forward. It's going to redo the email. Come on. How do you know if it's a local program? Um, if you have to log into a website to do your mail, like even uh, um, Source Cable, if you log into their website and do mail there, you're, you're doing cloud email. It's not local to you. It's on the cloud. All right, so I've, I've, uh, I've told the email I want to forward it to somebody so I can go to the to button here and I don't have any contacts. If I did, 
um, they would all be listed here. Double click the contact, it shows up. And off we go, send it. Um, I can make a brand new email message to send to my friends and family and contacts. Email, mess uh, email message, open it up here again. Um, click on the two, puts in the address that you, may, you have saved in your address book. Um, it, that's two. There is also a carbon copy function and a blind carbon copy function. Now, here's the trick with these copy functions or, or carbon copy functions. When you put an email address into the two line, you can put as many in there as you want. If you've got 100, you can put 100 in. When you send the message, everyone who gets the message can see who the email was sent to. Okay? Because they're all in the two line. The same holds true for carbon copy. You can put one in two into the two line. You can put, just to get it to go, you put one email address in there, and then carbon copy all the rest of them. And if you do that, the recipients of the email can see who got a carbon copy. There are certain instances where you may not want that to happen. You may not want certain people to know that you have sent an email to certain other people the same email. That's where blind carbon copy comes in. Because once you put an address into blind carbon copy, yes, it will send the email to that recipient in blind carbon copy, but nobody else can see who it went to. Blind carbon copy is a really useful little tool. If you have I'm not saying uh, security issues, but um, issues where um, you may not want one recipient to know that you're talking to another recipient about exactly the same email. Okay? It does happen. Businesses use it a lot. So you're, you're saying that I can put half a dozen addresses in that particular... Yes, you can put as many addresses into each line as you like. But if you have a lot of emails, uh, if you have a lot of people, I would suggest you just put one in the two line and then all the rest in the carbon copy line. Yeah, but the blind carbon copy. If I said put six names in there. Nobody can, uh, the, can tell the other five. Nobody can tell the other five. They'll just, uh, the recipient will just see, oh, you sent me an email. Blind carbon copy has nothing to do with it. You can't see who got the other emails, who you were sending to. Just the, the one recipient will see their own name. Okay, um, now, the other thing that is, um, it's not a requirement, but it is sort of a requirement, it's how email works, is a subject line. It's always good to put a subject line in. This goes back to the days when we did all of this in what's called the terminal, okay? Where you did email in a window that was all completely text and you had to put in each command, okay? You put in each command to make the email work. And if you knew what you were doing, it was just as fast as this. If you didn't know what you were doing, it would take you all day. <laughs> so the subject line is important. Among other things, it tells the email servers out there that your message may very well be important. Don't lose it. Okay? Uh, if it doesn't have a subject line, then the email server might very well say, um, well, most spammers don't put subject lines in their emails either. So this is probably spam, and it will send it to spam folders. So the subject line is important. And then below that is 
the body of your email where you'll place text or where you can put other things. Um, as we've said before, you can make attachments of pictures and movies and all kinds of other media. And those attachments um, might very well show up in the body of the email if the email package is capable of doing that kind of thing it will show up a video will show up as a window here which the email package on the other end can play okay or the picture will show up in here and it's in what we call inline okay it's not an attachment it's an inline attachment if it's a simple if it's a plain old attachment that perhaps the computer on the other end doesn't have a program yet to deal with it um, it will come in as a file attachment which the recipient on the other end can see oh this is a file attachment I don't have a program for it yet let's go get one okay so yes you can um, you've probably all gotten emails with pictures in the body of the text they are essentially um, just uh, put in there as attachments it's how the the um, this the program works now there are three kinds of email local programs there are three kinds they handle email in three different ways they handle it as plain text <coughs> okay so this is plain text uh, the two line the, the, the copy lines are plain text, the subject line is plain text, and most importantly, the body of the email is only plain text. It's sent as plain text and received as plain text on the other end. If you have a picture to attach, it's qu something quite different. It's handled in a very different way inside the email package. We're not going to get into it, but it is handled in a different way. There is a rich text format. We talked about that when we talked about documents. Here again, the, in the rich text format, we can make the text in, our, in the body of the text all red if you want to. And if the email package on the other end is capable of receiving that and seeing the rich text format, it will see red. When it comes in, there will be red text there. As well as um, simple inlines like JPEG uh, pictures that you can put in here and PNG pictures that you can put in there. They will all show up here uh, in rich text format. The final way that an email package can handle stuff is HTML. Now, HTML, hypertext markup language. That is how a web page works. That's the language of the web page, the hypertext markup language. Make a note of that. Most email packages now on modern computers by default handle email as HTML. So, all of the things that you can do on a web page, you can do in an email. You can compose them in HTML, and you can send them in HTML, and the people on the other end, in all probability, will receive your email as an HTML document. That, to my way of thinking, is a bad thing, folks. It's a bad thing. Um... Here's an email here. Here's my utility bill. We'll just have a look at that. So, what we have here is we have this in, H in an HTML format because we, you see here that these are underlined links as you would see them in a web page. Okay, you click on that and it will launch a, a web browser. 
to take you to Horizon Utilities. Okay? And if you click on the right one, it'll take you to your login page uh, or it will take you to your, um, your unsubscribe to email page or whatever. Um, and all of that is done in HTML, hypertext, hypertext markup language. Okay. That's all we're going to say about local email local to the computer here for the moment. Yes? I, I didn't quite catch why HTML is a bad... Okay. Why is it a bad idea? Because anything that you can do in a web page, you can do in an email. And so if you want to hide something malicious, in that email that the person on the other end will open, it's hidden, but it's functional. It's hidden, but it's functional. And so they open the email, and that hidden function goes to work. It can launch a program. It can take over your computer and uh, make changes to it as any program would in the background. That's why HTML can be a little dangerous. Uh, if you're in, most likely, you are running your computer as the administrator of that computer. In other words, the computer thinks you're God. Let's go back to this. It will do exactly as it's told to do because it thinks it's talking to God. <laughs> if you're a standard user, you're not God. The computer does not trust you. And if a program wants to launch another program, it, the computer says, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, God didn't tell me to do this. I'd better check with the user. And so you'll see that by checking with the user, a little dialog box will pop up saying, I am about to do dot, dot, dot. Did you do that? And you have the opportunity to say yes or no. If it wasn't you, then you know something's going on. So HTML can be dangerous if you're working in the administrative mode. It can also be dangerous as a standard user, but it's a little more difficult. Do you have a choice of those three options? Yes, you do. In the settings for your, for your email account, which we're not going to jump into because they're five clicks deep. Um, but you can change all of those settings um, to uh, make the, the emails that you get a little safer and the emails that you send a little safer. By the way, if you forward an HTML email to someone else and it has something hidden in it, you send them that hidden thing. Does it leave your computer though? Or does it, stay? it stays on yours and you give it to your friend. Could that be one of the viruses? That that's, how, that's how viruses sometimes work. That's definitely how malicious software works, which is not necessarily a virus, but it could be malware. Um, HTML is a good way to hide stuff. Okay? These links can be put in the background, and as I said before, it opens this link, but uh, if you click on it, but you can, in HTML, you can hide that link completely, but it's still there, and when the email launches on the other computer, it will launch. Okay? Did the provider catch that? Or? No. No, that no. Through no, it's an H, it's a web page. Yeah. It's a web page. Yes? So, Exactly. But it's yes. yes. Do you trust me? Yes, I do. Oh. <laughs> okay. Why I you? Okay. This this is um, this is the most salient thing about email today. You have to trust the person you're receiving the email from. 
You trust me to send you a link to a video and you get your video. If you suddenly got an email out of the clear blue from George Beggs at someplace.com, click this video. Don't do that. <laughs> it's not safe. You should not trust George Beggs at someplace.com if you don't know them. Will there not be a pop up saying uh, he's not in your contact? Nope. Nope. It's just an email. It's, it, it'll just you know, turn up there. Yeah, um, in, 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 yeah, in the, in the more, in, yeah, in the more security conscious email packages uh, of late, yes, that's going to happen. But in the older ones, no, it just, oh, okay. it just launches. Okay. So yes? Um, with iPads, if a, if a message is, is forwarded from somebody you trust and you get it, and it says on the bottom that person this message was sent from my iPad. Yeah. I know this guy doesn't have an iPad, but the person that he received that message from send it send it to him as yeah as, as an iPad. Yeah. Uh, um, now, okay. That that stuff. I um, just think it's yeah. Not from him. Um, all of that stuff um, can be looked into at a later date. Uh, I must tell you that um, the newest forms of sending emails through devices like telephones and tablets and, uh, and the like, um, can they be dangerous? Yes, because it's an, email, uh, it's an email package going through an email server like any other. And there are people out there who are going to try and trick you into clicking the link, downloading the file. You know, here's a great little picture of a cute little kid. Click. Oh no. Oh no. Blue screen oh death. Restart. Another blue screen oh death. Restart. What do I call now? <laughs> yeah. And you know what? You may have to, because um, these things can destroy, but that's not really their purpose anymore. If you're tricked to, into opening an email with a link on it, that means that somebody gets paid. It's all about the money. Links that get opened in web pages for advertising purposes are worth money. A few cents to numbers of dollars. Um, a guy last night explained it very well for me uh, on uh, one of the podcasts that I listened to. Um, there are some um, in in Google. The AdWords that people that companies buy um, are worth a few cents to a few dozen dollars. Um, the AdWords for cars are worth a few dozen dollars because a car is a big expensive item that if you are if you are talked into buying it, that few dozen dollars spent on getting you that opened ad is worth it. A few cents for a pair of shoes at a few dozen dollars is worth a few cents. The fact is, somebody got paid when that web page opened. And so it's in this day and age, it's all about who can trick you into opening a web link. It's worth money to them, not worth a damn thing to you, and it's dangerous. Okay, so it's all about the money. Um, let's move on right now to this. This is local email 
local to this computer. This computer is manipulating the messages to receive them or send them or save them or do something like that. And as I said, that's my Gmail account. Here also, is my Gmail account on gmail.com, a web page. Exactly the same emails are there in the same order, uh, made with the same kinds of folders from the same contacts that I've sent email to and I receive email from. It's all the same but it's all on a web page and it's all up there. Not local to here. Out there. There's something that confuses me. I've had Windows 10 on twice and deleted it twice for various reasons. But Gmail, if I use source cable, I get a list of my email. I yes. don't have to open them whether I like them or not. If I use Gmail, the mail will be open for me. Um, yes and no. It all depends on how you set Gmail up. You'll, you can see that right now, um, here's all my mail, but there's no conversations are open. On the, on the other package, uh, I had it set up a little differently. Here's that same Horizon Utilities bill, and there is a preview of the email in the preview pane. But I, in, on the web page, I have not activated the preview pane. The preview will only come if I activate the email by clicking on it. Now I've got a preview of it. It works exactly the same as the local package. You can set them up differently. And you can do that for every kind of email. If you're logging into uh, to Source's uh, webmail, you can set it up exactly. It's going to look different. But it can be set up exactly the same way as your local email account. Yes? What's the point in having two then? Um, if I don't have this computer with me, I can open my phone and log into gmail.com on, on my phone and see exactly what I've got. So I can open my email at my door. Exactly so. Just simply by going to outlook.com, log in as you, there's your stuff. You don't have to have a local email client to do and in some instances, maybe it's not advisable. How many of you spend the winter in Florida or down south, snowbirds, or no, no people that do? I use, my, I use the computer when I'm Sure. When you travel. Yeah. Um, now, here's, here's another reason to use a webmail package if it's available to you. Um, in source cable, if you used your computer locally for source cable to do all your email, if you travel outside of the source cable service area, I forget which one it was now. It's, um, yeah, quick click. Um, it's either you can't send, you can't send email from somewhere else with a local email client in Quick Click. If you're in Toronto and you've got your laptop with you and you've got a good connection and you open your email package, you can't you can receive email, but you can't send anything. I think I'd send it from Ireland. Depends on the the uh, service provider that you have to be logged into. Most of them. I would say 80% of them do not allow strangers to use 
port 25, which is the email send port. They don't allow it. Most of them don't. They'll allow you to receive on port 110, but not to send. When I was in England, I couldn't send through Hotmail. Yeah. I had to use my sister's address wouldn't let it change to mine. Right. Um, these are all security concerns about mail. Email has been around for more than 50 years. And its format essentially is unchanged. It's been enhanced, but it is essentially unchanged. Port 25 is how you send mail. Port 110 is how you receive mail. In the background, in the background, you call an email server with a get command. And once you've got to that get command, to the email server, then you have to say hello to it and tell it who you are. And when you say hello to it, you don't say H-E-L-L-O, you say H-E-L-O colon Bob Willia at gmail.com. That's the format. That's it was invented 50 years ago. It is unchanged as of today. Unchanged. You have to tell, when you give it the get commands, you have to tell it what port to go and get from. Because now there are several. There's uh, the 110 port. There's the, the, uh, nine, the 143 port, the 995 port, 996 port. These are all windows, if you like on the wider world around an email server. We're not going to go into the details of that, but essentially it's unchanged over 50 years. So let's, we're, we're back to um, a web page for email. Now I have put all of my contacts into the, uh, onto the web page um, for my Google account for Gmail. I also have them locally stored on this computer, but they are all here as well. So if I have occasion to not have this computer with me, but just my telephone, my contacts are here, all saved on a web page. And when you change them on one, they automatically change on the other? Um, no, no, they don't. That's why you have to use things uh, like synchronizers. There are programs that will synchronize your local email account to your cloud email account. Um, I'm just loading up right now my contact list here. Uh, let's see if it's going to load. Um, but we'll come back. We'll come back to this. And um, as I said, you you get the uh, you get the preview, and in the preview. Uh, there are ways to uh, reply to the email, okay? The little drop-down arrow gives you an opportunity to forward the email. Let me just click on it here. Okay, all of the other commands that the, are, that the local email client would have are all available here. Reply, forward, uh, filter, print your messages, uh, show original copies of, of the messages as they come in. Sometimes they're truncated just to make the, the page a little easier to read. All of that stuff is available on a web page. So the, the best thing about webmail is that if your computer crashes big time, Serious big time damage. You've got your email. It's safe. It's out there. Not here. And all of those pictures that people sent to you, you might have saved them locally to your computer, but if you have a webmail address, they're all there. You didn't lose them. They're still there somewhere and recoverable. But if you burn this to the ground, 
Nothing is recoverable. I can't help you. Okay? Uh, That's a huge advantage of a local. It tells you, like, it's more problems than... Yeah. Uh, the advantage, okay? The advantage is that um, with Gmail, I'm telling Google my entire life, and I'm trading that for their services, for their email services, for their document services, uh, for their tracking services. I'm trading all of that. I'm trading my information for their service. Okay, I'm up for that. But if I don't want to do that, then essentially I'm going to do that with a private, local email client. Well, I've tried to cancel Gmail. I've tried to Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, I've tried to change my address on Gmail. Good luck with that. Yeah, they don't want... It can be done. It's about 10 pages deep in the settings that you can you can delete your email account and you have to know exactly where you're going to do it. Even I, it would take me all afternoon to find it. Well, when I have gone through hours <laughs> trying to get out of Google completely because that's the only way to change your email address well, the, in the Gmail. Um, you can just simply abandon uh, the email address that you have and tell everybody, well, here's my new one. Yeah, instead, of George, instead of George Beggs at Google. Gmail, it's now George Beggs 2 at Gmail, I mean, which is a completely Gmail different... Any, yeah. Anymore. Yeah. I mean, and by the way, in. by the way, um, I am also moving other email accounts through Gmail. Um... I don't know whether I can get it to do it or not. Um, by the way, here's my... No, here's a preview of my, my contacts, all of my contacts in Gmail. But uh, I don't know how long this might take. So we'll just have a look at it. Um, I'll go into the settings. See how long it's going to take to, for them to come up. Uh, oh, here they are. In the settings page under accounts, I have my Gmail address, bobwillia at gmail. I have my local, um, or I have an email address from uh, my service provider, Bell. So bswillia at bell.net. I'm also moving my company business through Gmail. So I'm telling info at the binary guys, go through Gmail. I don't want to log into <coughs> um, webmail at the binary guys. I don't want to, it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, but so actually... all of my info at binary guys comes to Gmail. And if I want to uh, reply to a message from my binary guys email uh, service, Google will say, oh, okay, you're, you're answering to the, to the binary guys. We will tell the people on the other end, oh, this is coming from the binary guys, not Gmail. It's a setting, okay? It's, it's really neat. But I, we're, we're going down a rabbit hole here, folks. We're getting away from basics, okay? We don't want to go down rabbit holes. So... Um, <coughs> Let's go back to, let's go back to our inbox and um, where else do I want to take this? Oh, um, now Gmail is uh, of late has been, and, and some of the other email packages uh, uh, are trying to be helpful as well. Um, Yahoo's doing it um, to some degree and so is Outlook. Um, what's happening here is, is it has given me three, full, uh, three tabs. My primary email, uh, 
uh, email for all messages that come from my social networks like Facebook. And messages, the matches, twee, messages that come from where I buy things, Amazon. And so if I click on where do I buy things, promotions, uh, oh, there's STV Soapy Mondays. <laughs> it's also brought me an ad from MasterCard and uh, another one from Global Internet Backbone at 30, 32 cents a megabit. Eh, no, I don't want to buy them. Um, STV, I remember now what it was. STV is Scottish television. I, lo I logged into them one day and I don't know why. And I've been getting email ever since. Um, the other, th the one last thing about uh, having a webmail email address, a Gmail address, a, a Yahoo address, uh, a Hotmail or, or Outlook.com address is just simply for that. If you want to go around the internet and, and uh, open accounts for stuff, something that might interest you, use your crappy old Gmail account. Crappy old address at gmail.com. All of the crapola from them and who they have sold your email address to will go there. Leaving you your good email address, leave it alone. Yeah, the, no, it, it doesn't fill up. No, it's, it just sits there waiting for somebody to go see it. So is there a limit of how many will go there before it starts deleting the bottom to put more on top of anything like that? Yeah, but who cares? <laughs> who cares? I'm not going to go there and, and see their crappy emails. I just want a login. That's all I'm getting. A login ID. They want my email address, crappy old email address, to at gmail.com. If you've used an, uh, one of these, like uh, outlook.com, and it cra Windows Live Mail crashed with for me, it hasn't started since August. Yeah. You can abandon that and get another one then? If yes. You, yeah. yeah. You just, I, what, crappy old email address, yeah. 10. <laughs> I worried that I'd used it as ID, so I had to make sure it was working. No, no. If you've used it as ID yeah. um, just to get accounts, yeah. um, you're still going to log in with that ID. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's written down somewhere, hopefully. But the other thing is, uh, if you if you have banking with that ID, okay, you've got to change it. Yeah. Uh, banking or, or anything else, uh, your, your utility bills or anything, if, if that messes up, you've got to go back in and change it. Um, so there you go. There's uh, the basics of uh, email packages for the web and for locally on your computer. Any questions about either one? Can I have two addresses in Outlook? I can't have a Gmail as far as I can see other than you can have as many as you want. If your main address is georgebags at gmail.com and that's working and all of your all of the folks that you want to talk to know you as georgebags at gmail.com you can make another account georgebags2 at gmail.com you can keep going and keep going what you do is when it asks you for, uh, when you make a second account, George Bags 2, it'll ask you, well, where's an old email address we can get a hold of you? You just give them George Bags. Now you want to make George Bags 3. All right, you've got two, it's working, you want to make three. Well, you tell George Bags 3 when it asks you, is there an old email address we can get to you? Yeah, you give it George Bags too. <laughs> I, uh, I keep getting this. Click on the confirmation email. Yeah. I don't get a confirmation email. 
it Where may it? It, it may be hidden in a spam folder. It may have downloaded to a spam folder or a junk email folder. You've got to look in there. Sometimes you've got to look around. I mean, I can, I can send an e a test email, or I do send a test email from yeah. Source Cable to my new... No, as far as Source Cable is concerned, it goes. Yeah. But I can't find it. Um, I don't know how you're doing it. I would have to look. You'd have to run me through the process I mean, that I you're can doing. Use that yeah. Accounts thing that yeah. You'd have to run me through the process that you're doing for me to understand it. I can't see what you're seeing. So. I, I, I realize it's. <laughs> yeah. If you sign yourself in as an administrator somewhere down the line, and now you don't really, like you're talking about, that could be a bit of a problem. It's safer to not be the administrator. Can you turn that off? Or can you? Yes. Yeah, you can. You can change back and forth between standard user and administrator. and administrator user, but you have to do that from an administrator account. Now you can either do that from the built-in administrator account, which you would activate, or you just put in a, uh, an administrative user and never use that account. So you could be user, user and be administrator. You can make another account user2 and make that a standard account, but you've done that from the user account. You can change you can change user two to an administrator, but you have to do it through the user account. Okay. All right. Okay, Windows ten. Yes. I, I know you talked about VLA or something for to download for playing. Oh, VLC, yeah. But how do you load a program without a DVD? Without a DVD? Um, I mean, is there a, can I find a program for Windows 10 that will allow me to load DVDs? Program? Um, DVDs? Do you have a DVD player on your computer? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, what's happened is that... Um, Windows 10 has done away with many of the functions of this little thing right here called the media player. Okay, they've changed those functions and crippled a lot of them. Let me see if I can launch it here. Um, yeah, Windows media player. Um, I'm not going to do anything with it because I don't want it to mess this computer up, but um, they have changed a lot of the functions of Windows Media Player. Now, among other things, it's always been problematic for a computer to play video files that are in the MPEG-2 format. Because um, the MPEG-2 format is um, proprietary. It's a proprietary video format, and so is MPEG-4. And so, and because Microsoft does not want to pay the rights holders of MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 any money, they don't allow the media player to play those formats. If they allowed it, then they would have to pay. Yeah, but if I go to Staples and buy a program, Yep. Windows 10 won't load it. Oh, you're, you're, um... I don't care about, you know, it. Um... I mean, you give it a program, what is it, MVLA or something? Um, I, I, here again, I can't see why it wouldn't, um, because, um... Like this VLC media player, I've, I've downloaded it in Windows 10 and told Windows 10 to load it and it works. I don't know what, how, you're, how you're being defeated here. I don't know how it's stymieing you, why it won't load the program. Well, I haven't loaded a VLA or whatever you call it. Yeah, VLC. Yeah, I haven't loaded that because that's purely for him. No, it's for yeah. all media. It's for all media. It's for music and videos, um, all media, all, all different formats of media. 
So will it work if I go to load a program? Well, when you say load a program, what, what do you mean load a program? I've got all kinds of programs. DVDs? Photograph, yeah, DVD programs. Um, programs on DVD. Okay, I see what you're saying now. Um, I, at least I think I do. Okay. okay. I am... Architect, I mean, I have an yeah. architect program. Yeah. Here is the, uh, the file structure of Windows 10. Okay? Where are you in that? Now, I, I opened a file explorer. All right? If I go down here to this entry, this PC, you'll, you'll see that it has a little check mark yeah. beside it. And I'm going to click on that, and it gives me some other things. Yeah, it never, with me, it never uh, opens a DVD. Well, here is, uh, when I click on this PC, I can see my local C drive where everything is, and it also shows me the DVD drive. If there was a disk in there that the computer knew about, it would tell me there's a disk in there. Mine doesn't show DVD drive. Um, how old is your computer? Oh, it's relatively new, so Windows 7 computer. Yeah, it, it, it's not surprising that the drive may be damaged. Um, so if you, to yeah, if to, to, to test that, to test that, get yourself a thumb drive, like this, a thumb drive. Plug it into the computer and do as I just did go to this uh, this PC. If you can't see the thumb drive, it's no problem. Okay, then your DVD drive is damaged. But if I the computer can't see it, it's damaged. But it works fine with Windows 7. I've tried to download it. Uh, I tried to download it, what do you call it, the driver program, but Yeah, no, the, the yeah. yeah. Uh, stay away from driver programs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I've it twice and deleted it twice. <laughs> well, you're lucky to be able to get back to Windows 7. Good for you. <laughs> okay, that's pretty much our time. I will get, uh, I will get this uh, video out to you. Uh, if not later today, sometime tomorrow. I'm getting busied up for the, for the week, but I will get it done as quickly as I can. Thank you so much for coming. And um, for those of you that want me to come and see them sometime this week, um, give me a call when I get back to my office and we'll try to put together a time. Okay? Thank you so much. And what's next week's program about? What's next week's pro? Oh. It's a rant. Um, yeah, there will be a rant. There may also be a special guest, if not next week, the week after. Huh? And it won't be James. Bill Gates? <laughs> no. That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.